November 14th. Welcome to Picture Language Seminar. We're here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm very happy to have you with Eva visiting us for a couple of days. Elena got her doctorate at Moscow State University, worked in Germany at the Max Planck Institute and the University of Bonn. This is the Institute of Fourier Analysis and Development after that went to Newcastle University and about a year and a half ago came to New York to chair of my department at City College in New York. We're very happy to hear about the work on higher dimensional structures. He's an expert on buildings, administrative system physics, and we look forward to hearing what you're going to tell us today. Thank you very much, Arthur. It's always a pleasure to speak the picture language uh, seminar. And uh, yeah, so we, we met with Ar Arthur about seven years ago, and uh, uh, Arthur has this great, great intuition to see things which could be relevant in physics. And I think that it took us like seven years, but now we are probably already ready to discuss some like more, more concrete results like and it fits really very well to the picture language because I, I do mainly pictures right my, my research is like mainly mainly pictures and um uh so this is my plan i'm going to give a brief introduction to to the theory of buildings usually one needs a half of a year graduate course just to give the definition of a building but uh I hope I will be able to, to do this like in, a, in 10 minutes. And then we talk um, about um, arithmetic lattices and then actually about cut zero geometry. Then of course, like people usually like probably not, not, not really study cut zero geometry and physics, but I think it's very relevant and it may uh, help to kind of like certain structures and so on. And then if time permits, I will talk a little bit about the connection with the assist algebra theory, but not in probably not in very much details because it's like how you connect assist algebra to all of this is a bit, a bit technical. Um, okay, but let's introduce buildings and um, they were introduced by Jacques Tietz in the 50s. To study like Lie groups, it was a very algebraic definition, and the buildings have like algebraic analytic number theoretical aspect. And um, even if you if you will forget the definition after this talk, you still should remember probably that the buildings consist of chambers and apartments satisfying certain axioms. And each apartment consists of a chest, uh, set of chambers. And even before given like really formal definition of a building, uh, I will I will define probably like the, the easiest non non trivial building in dimension one is like um, a finite a finite projective plane. So actually, all my talks I start with the same definitions because although there are some new people in the audience and. No one ever complained that they've heard already some definitions. So, uh, so, so probably you've seen you've seen this graph before, not only in my talks. Uh, so what is what is this graph? This graph is a uh, incidence graph of a finite projective plane of order two. For example, you can think about red vertices as points and blue vertices um, as lines. And you can always see that um, for every two points, there is a line which contains both of them, right? And the other way around, every two lines intersect at exactly one point. So this is like projective geometry. But we will need this type of graphs to have them as so-called links in complexes of like higher dimensions. But what are chambers here? The chambers here are edges, and apartments are cycles of length six. And you see this property of a building that any two chambers always contained in one apartment. So in this 
building, you can get any two edges, but you always find an apartment which contains both of them. You can always find a cycle which contains both, both of the edges. And this is kind of what, uh, this is kind of the most spectacular property of a building that any two apartments, any two chambers are always contained in an apartment. And of course, if you work in dimension one, it's not a problem. Any case, like any one dimensional building can be embedded in a three dimensional space. You can draw it in a three dimensional space, but if you go to higher dimensions, then uh, you cannot work, um, you, can, you cannot draw your buildings in, um, yeah, on, on a board or on a piece of paper. So you have to have some methods to, to work with them. And so, but, so, so, so what happens that sometimes I skip the definition of a building because of course, if you didn't work on buildings before, it can look confusing. But on the other hand, people always tell me, ah, like, give the definition, right? Probably, and, and then I give it and I say, yeah, it doesn't help. But nevertheless, now I give always the formal definition of a building how I, it's like geometric uh, geometric building. So they consist of chambers and apartments satisfying the following axioms. So um, for me, an n-dimensional Euclidean or hyperbolic building, it's an n-dimensional complex such that X is a union of n-dimensional spaces called apartments where the tiles of the tessellation are chambers. Then for any two chambers, there is an apartment containing both of them. And if two apartments have non-trivial intersection, then there is an isomorphism of the apartments um, fixing their intersection point-wise. And straight away, I can um, give a definition of a, or not a definition, but just an example of a one-dimensional one Euclidean building which is the Kelly graph of a free group. So free group on two generators, say, imagine you have a just wedge of, it's like elementary, elementary topology. So it's kind of elementary topology. We know that the, uh, fundamental group of a graph is three, right? And the three group of two generators can be regarded as the uh, fundamental group of just a wedge of circle, right? You have a graph with the, like you have one, one vertex and two loops. And um, then the universal cover is a tree, right? Such that every vertex has a valence C4. I will come back to this picture that later if I have time. But now let's have an exercise. So we look at the definition of a building, right? And I tell you this is the one dimensional Euclidean building. So please tell me now what are the chambers and what are the apartments? So what are the apartments? What are the one-dimensional Euclidean spaces? It's just a line, right? Yes. So so here, yeah, this is the um, Kelly graph of the three groups. So it's like infinite, uh, infinite lines. So you see that you have <coughs> uncountably many lines, right? It's just because like you can draw them as a line, but abstractly, it's, they are all lines, right? They are all copies of R. And, okay, and now what is the chamber? What? It's not the point, it's a point, it's an edge between two points. Right, so it's the edge, but you are 
right? That we have to look at the po at the points. We can we can interpret points as elements of the three groups, right? So it's like what is what is the Kelly Kelly graph? Probably in this audience, one has to remind what is the Kelly graph, right? We start with some like. Uh, element which is kind of uh, identity and then you move to the next one by multiplying uh, by a generator right so it's like how the Kelly what is the Kelly graph of a group it's like the vertices of the Kelly graph corresponds to elements of a group and then the edges correspond to the generators and then you move from one vertex to the other um, when you when two uh, two elements can be uh, obtained by multiplication by a generator, right? So then you go further and further. So we have like, and this is a free group. And what is what is also important then here that we can think about the boundary of of this building or the boundary of the graph, right? If you have some kind of starting point, you can think about infinite, infinite path. And each point at infinity, it's an infinite path, right? So then you can think about the action of the free group on its boundary. And this is, this is something which, uh, which can be relevant later. But so far, we, we just want to see the setting that, um, first of all, like here it's a building, right? That we have the, the apartments are um, just lines tessellated by just by by some segments, right? And each segment is an apartment. And now you can check, right? We can on, on this example we can check the uh, properties of the building that here yeah, imagine that you have two uh, any two chambers, you have like one segment somewhere here, one segment somewhere here, but you can always find an infinite path from one point at infinity to another point at infinity, which contains both, both of those chambers, right? You can always like find, find an apartment which contains both of them. And then you can also, check the third ax axiom that if two apartments have a non-trivial intersection, right? So saying you have like one apartment, this one which you already had, and you have some other apartment, and they coincide here, but then there is an isomorphism of the of those two apartments fixing the intersection point Y. So you just fix, yeah, the intersection is fixed point wise by the, uh, this, those parts are saying interchange and those parts are interchanged. So, so there is kind of isomorphism of the apartments. But what is important to emphasize here that this isomorphism of the apart, it's, um, of the apartments cannot be extended to the whole building. No, it's really just the isomorphism apartments, but also how you can think about it. You can think about it that all the apartments in the building are the same type of tessellation. Okay, so now are there any questions about like one dimensional buildings? Because now we are going to move to, to like higher dimensions. So we have to kind of understand this basis very well. So are there any questions probably from the audience as well? Sorry, are there questions? No questions. Okay, so for uh, let, we, we first go to dimension two because even the dimension two uh, only has some kind of um, uh, aspects which, which you don't have in dimension one. So first of all, how I um, think about polyhedra. So about polyhedra, I think that it's like two-dimensional two polyhedra. It's a set of polygons with certain labeling on the uh, on the edges and orientation. So.
So the blue wings are done in the following way that you identify the edges with the same label respecting orientation. So of course, like from the algebraic topology course, everybody remembers this uh, picture of a torus when you identify uh, the opposite sides of the torus and you get a torus with um, embedded bunch of circles. But here you, you can draw it very nicely in this three in this three-dimensional space. But for example, this polyhedron you cannot draw in the um three-dimensional space because um you will have um a lot of like self intersection. It's a little bit like like Mervus, like several Mervus strips glued together, but even even worse because this is like um uh, yeah, so this is quite uh, involved uh, labeling scheme. But one of the reasons we are interested in uh, in such uh, polyhedra because the universal covers will be buildings, so. There is a kind of reason to construct them. Okay, so any questions about the definition of the polyhedron? Because of course, very often people think about platonic solids and so on, but here it's like, what is about our polyhedra? They are so called like thick polyhedra. So in each, uh, think each edge is contained in several like in, in, in several polygons. So it's like branching structures. So you see why uh, why I really talk so long about this because people by, by now people are already kind of used to to graphs. But the question what are the reasonable generalizations of graphs and like people several people in the audience uh, like already work like with hypergraphs and so on but then like for example on hypergraphs you don't have enough of intrinsic geometry right because we still want to work with like we, we want to have euclidean metric or hyperbolic metric or some other types of um, uh, of curvature and geometry and, and so on, but if like in the structure of hypergraphs, there is not uh, not enough of it. So that's why I kind of suggest to look more closely like at polyhedra also from the point of view of like um, uh, applications in, in theoretical physics. And also you see that it's not manifold because in my like previous visit to Harvard, now I realized that people were, when I was saying like, okay, let's look at uh, dimension two, dimension three, I have an impression that probably people were thinking about the uh, dimension of manifolds. But actually we don't look at manifolds. So in uh, links of manifolds are spheres, but we need like highly singular spaces as links to construct buildings. So, okay, but now let's uh, uh, go through this definition of a link. Uh, let's take a sphere of a very small radius at the point of a polyhedron. Like imagine like here in this vertex, you got a sphere, which is kind of black, black sphere. And then the intersection of this sphere with the complex is a graph. So here the graph is just one vertex and or for, yeah, for edges. No, you don't need to. Uh, yeah, no, I just think it's fine. Then. Okay, so yeah, so the link in the two dimension is just a graph which gives you the intersection of the sphere with your polyhedron. Okay, so now uh, are there any questions? What are the links? Yeah, straight away, next slide.
still this embedding of the vagal circle uh, circles into the uh, torus can be regarded as a polyhedron. So now the question, the exercise for the audience, what is the link in this vertex? So please look at the definition and look at the this vertex and decide what is what is the what is the link. And even there is a there is a there is a hint here, right? Circle. Yeah, very good. Yeah, very good. <laughs> very good student. Yeah. So this is just a circle. So you see that indeed. So the link and this um, it's a uh, sometimes one call it like a cyclic cyclic graph. So it's just a kind of four you know, four vertices and four edges. And indeed, this is S one, right? It's like S one. So like the torus, it's a Manifold, it's a two dimensional manifold, right? So that's why the link is a, is a sphere, it's one, one dimensional sphere. But uh, now we want to construct buildings, and for buildings, we need much more involved links. So, in the example of the four squares, uh, which I showed a couple of slides ago, the link, like if you, if you do your homework, you take those. Um, for squares, you identify the uh, edges with the same label respect in orientation, and then you compute the link. So the link will be this complete bipartite graph. Of course, it's like one of the easiest cases, but it's already involved enough to, uh, to explain many ideas. So this graph has diameter two and verse four. So what is the diameter? The diameter is the maximal distance between two vertices, right? So if, if you pick here any like two vertices, you can see that uh, the distance cannot be more than two. And what is the distance between uh, vertices in the graph? It's just the number of edges, the minimal number of edges which you need to go from, from one vertex to the other, okay? And the length of the shortest cycle, yeah, it's kind of really the, the, the length of the shortest cycle, and the length of the shortest cycle here is four. And if we come back to the Hewitt graph, which we had on our first slide, one of the first slides, that graph has diameter three and length four, or length six, it's so called like generalized hexagons. Okay, so any questions about this kind of combinatorial definitions of the graph and the verse. Okay, so now we have uh, already enough to formulate a nice result of Weinman and Brin, and Brin is actually the father of the Google Brin. I never met him in real life because when I started to do buildings roughly 20 plus years ago, I think he was already living in some mansion and not coming to conference and not buildings anymore. So, and uh, in, in, in this paper, it's a paper in publication of <coughs> years, there are many more ideas and this, um, this is a simplification of one of their results, but nevertheless, it's really a very, very useful because you can start working with buildings uh, without learning the full theory of teeth. And straight away, we already have some examples to work with. So if you have a compact two-dimensional polyhedron, like we were talking about, and if all links are graph of diameter m and verse 2m, then the universal cover of the polyhedron is a two-dimensional building. So this theorem generalizes this example here, which we have in one dimension. So in, in one dimension, like for example, this wedge of circles is a 
analog of a polyhedron which we have there, right? So we have a we have a polyhedron, and then the universal cover is a building. And of course, in dimension one, it's not a problem to get buildings, right? Because it's still kind of graphs, which are more, more or less easy to work with. So you can straight away get those Euclidean, Euclidean buildings in dimension one. It's just kind of infinite trees, and they are well understood. Like, for example, there is a book, book of cell called trees, right? And we're building, uh, we're, trees are considered as buildings as well. But to go to the higher dimensions, we, we, we need to work a bit, right? And uh, so their, their result, actually the paper is um, written on the language of, uh, uh, of differential geometry and dynamical systems. You almost don't see combinatorics there. So actually you have to work to get those polyhedra because it's like, they are result that if you get such a such a polyhedron, then then the universal cover is a building. But then the question: how you how do you get those complexes? How you find the words which you have to uh, write on the boundary of your of your uh, like polygons to to get to this polyhedron? And this is like when. I started, it was published in um, uh, 2002, but I kind of, I think it was about 2000 when I came up with something which I call like polygonal presentations. And this was a set of words such that you have to, that if you, if you write them on the boundary of the disks, then the gluing will give you like a nice polyhedron. But then it's kind of a byproduct that you can even actually each graph, each bipartite graph can be realized as the link of some polyhedra. So it's not necessarily for buildings, right? It's like kind of you get interesting examples in some other fields, like we had we had a paper with, with Mathilde Marcoli and some of her postdocs like about 15 years ago when we did like non-commutative geometry on trees and buildings. So we were using this kind of constructions to, to get like spectral triples and so on, but it's kind of another, another story. But you see what happens that um, if you go from the dimension two to the dimension three and higher, your life becomes even much more complicated. And the reason is the following then when you work in your, so let me come back to them, to these two dimensional examples, right? So we, we get those words. So, and we, what is our aim, right? The, this, we want to find such sets of words that if you write them on the boundary of the disks, we glue it all together, we get the polyhedron such that the universal cover is a building, right? So we have to find some way, how do we get the links which, which we need? But what is the important property of, um, of, of this set of words? That any two consecutive letters in your word define the whole thing, divide, define the whole word, right? So you cannot. Uh, because like those um, uh, uh, those graphs which we want to have as links, they don't have multiple edges. So you have to so here like any pair of consecutive letters anywhere defines the whole word. And with them in dimensions three and higher, it has some uh, unintended consequences that if you try to put your words into cubes, you may have some kind of uh, uh, extra problems that your set of words may happen not to be compatible. Because like imagine you have a cube and you have a set of words which you put 
on the sides of the cube. And it may happen that your diagonal, which goes from one vertex to the opposite vertex, is defined twice. Because like any two um, kind of edges here define those ones, and so on, this one and this one define those ones. And the edges, which are opposite to, to this um, main diagonal, is uh, defined like in two in two different ways. So you may have this kind of over uh, over definition. And it was actually, you may look, I think it's probably somewhere also in YouTube in one of the seminars, which we had like long uh, time ago, probably five years ago, it turned out this construction of the uh, cube complexes, um, uh, which I had, um, give new solutions of so-called young Baxter equation. So it's it's another kind of interesting connection with, with physics. And um, so to get to get this kind of polyhedra in higher dimensions, we needed some kind with of, a collaborator man Jakob Sticks and his um, former student Niti Rugona Perón. Uh, we needed some kind of hardcore quaternion algebras, which are even generalization of, of curvis quaternions. And since we have some number theorists in the audience, I will give you the kind of, like my, my um, collaborator from number theorists and that is like down to earth construction, but uh, uh, it's quite involved, but what is good with it that you still can put it into like two slides. And again, like if you didn't work with number theory before, then of course, like you you, you may just ignore it, but if you've seen the uh, uh, kind of um, finite fields before, then you can see that it's not so difficult to, to do these computations in, a, in, in finite fields. So what we are doing now, we are setting the scene to be able to find those words, right, which we draw on the squares, such that then we put them later on into sides of the cubes. And those cubes we glue together, such that, that if you glue those cubes together, then the universal cover is a building as well. And what is the technical, another technical difficulty with cubes that the um, interesting uh, buildings you get when you, each phase is contained in at least three cubes, right? This is again, like completely different from buildings, right? That if, so I was already explaining that we are interested in the uh, thick buildings in the case of two dimensions, right? That each edge is, belongs to at least three three squares or three triangles and so on. But here, like already, each face belongs to several cubes. So clearly you cannot draw it in the three-dimensional space, right? But now the construction is how you like, just to give a, to give a, like a, just a flavor, right, of the subject, how you tackle this problem, right? Because even with modern computers, if you, try to like glue, glue together probably like 100 cubes that they give given links. It's still, even with the modern computers, you cannot tackle it. So you want to have some kind of structure behind. And what we do here is practically a computation in finite fields. So we take some prime power number and then we take a, a generate a multiplicative group of the field with few square elements. And then we solve some equations in, in this finite field, right? For example, you can always find for each i and j, you can find such deltas, such that that delta in the power x, y, j equal to one plus uh, uh, delta 
uh, to the power j minus one and so on. It's actually, if you program this process, it just milliseconds. It doesn't take any time to find to find those solutions. And now to, to continue, we just need the, those numbers L of i and j and k of i and j. So I, uh, okay, are there any questions? Because like Arthur was like <laughs> shaking, shaking, shaking your head. And so please, please ask. If, if you point to a screen, it's better to point to that one. Ah, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we have here like L I and J and K I and J and J and I and J is some uh, elements of the field uh, of the multiplicative group of the field of few square elements which are not comparable modulo of few minus one. Okay. And now straight away we can define like groups which act simply transitively on uh, buildings, which are here in this case, like products of trees. So actually it was the first like very explicit examples of arithmetic lattices in finite characteristic. And uh, this is uh, something which is uh, really a bit counterintuitive because of course like in, in number theory and of course in many other fields like we we know very well there is a uh, book of uh, Jean-Pierre Serre called Trees and uh, uh, in according to, to Jean-Pierre like trees can be presented as buildings both in finite characteristic and in characteristic zero like as, uh, as buildings like PIDX buildings and very often when like it's, it's not the theory of buildings but some other fields when people say like Bruatix buildings they think about PIDX building such that that it's a, a geometric realization is a tree but of course there are many more and those ones are uh, finite characteristic buildings in higher uh, in higher dimensions. But for our purposes here, how to fit it to, uh, to, um, to the uh, constructions I was talking about before. So you see here we have like words of length four. And if we put those words of length four on the boundary of the squares, then we glue them together, we get plenty of cubes, we fill in the cubes, then we start uh, gluing cubes. We also like, uh, when we, we fill them in with cubes of dimension four and so on. Okay, so like it's a very, very explicit description of, um, uh, like of complexes of higher dimensions such that you have buildings straight away. And also what you have a byproduct here that the, these groups act simply transitively on a building, uh, like it's a co-compact quotient just with one orbit. And saying one of the reasons why, why my collaborator, like yeah, Jakob Stix was interested uh, in, in this project that because from the, uh, not the theoretical methods, it's like uh, known that uh, if you have uh, like this kind of uh, Lee, Lee groups, then uh, you can find co-compact lattices somewhere, but it's a very, very abstract result. You cannot find out how many orbits would you have in this action. And here you have just one, one orbit and how it's like, what, what are the other similar appearances in the literature that uh, in the characteristic zero, for example, there are so-called like fake projective planes of David Mumford. And then there were like um, uh, fake quadrics of um, um, Bovil. And uh, with, uh, with Jakob Six, we also kind of constructed probably first example of a fake quadric in, in um, 
in characteristic in in finite characteristic. But of course, this algebraic geometric uh, algebraic geometry is really quite involved, and it's not for like short uh, overview talk. Okay, are there any questions? So this is the the easiest example. It's like when you have a prime p equal to five, and you will have so what the what will be the building here? You will have three trees of valence six. So we see this is valency four, this is like valency six, but then when you have a Cartesian product of several trees, then like the analog of um, edges here, you will have as chambers, you will have um, cubes, but here is links. You will already have two dimensional simplicial complexes. Right, so like here, okay, here, the link here is just like set of points. The link here was a, was the graph. The link in our complex before was a complete bipartite graph, but the links here would be already some kind of um, very non-trivial. Uh, so each would, would be also a building and each apartment would be a triangulation of a sphere, but then you would have a lot of sphere, triangulated um, spheres as uh, like glued together as a leaf, right? But then now again, like the idea how we, how we make this construction, right? So we have this plenty, plenty of squares, we glue them together like respecting orientation and we start filling it with the cubes. And the universal cover of the building, and this group acts acts on the building with just one word. Okay. So um, I would like to show one of the applications which people in geometry group theory are interested, but uh, I think it may become relevant in some of the models. We can discuss it later why, why I think that it's relevant. Uh, but um, so what is like, it's like a li li little bit of the history in the geometry group theory. Uh, actually, when um, people like Misha Gromov started to look at the hyperbolic groups, there was always a question, can you uh, find an example of a hyperbolic group which is not residually finite? And it's still widely open. But then people thought, okay, like, it's hard to construct a hyperbolic group which is not residually finite. But now let's try to at least construct some cut zero group which is not residually finite. And the first example was done by Danny Weiss in, in 96, and then it was further developed by Berger and Moses. But it's like in dimension two. But what does it mean, roughly saying, if you haven't seen um, residually finite groups before, it's um, uh, non residually finite groups before, what does it mean that the group doesn't have like somehow many finite quotients? Right? It's kind of slightly. Uh, weaker than being a simple, right? And then uh, with uh, using this high dimensional lattice with, with the Jacob sticks, we were able to construct non-residually finite cut zero groups in any dimension. Because what you what you can do, we take our arithmetic lattices. But then there is some like really technical construction. Doubling doesn't mean a double cover. It means that more or less you take your complex 
you kind of cut the cubes and then you glue them in a completely different way such that you will destroy all the finite portions of its cover, right? So in a way, like um, saying those arithmetic rooms, they have like places, right? It's like they are, they are very nice and um, they are residually finite because those uh, arithmetic groups and finite characteristics, they have a lot of P groups as um, uh, finite covers, but we have some procedure to cut the cubes and then to glue them back in such a way you still have a building and you don't destroy your links, but you destroy all the finite, all the finite portions. Okay. But again, the difficulty why this was not done before, because the difficulty is exactly this, you have to solve this problem of compatibility of cubes in dimensions three and higher, right? You have to solve it somehow, and here it's like, luckily there is this, uh, there are quaternion algebras which uh, work very well. Okay, and then I have a little bit of time to just give a feeling of the um, connections with the sister algebras, right? And also to give the definition of the higher dimensional uh, graphs, right? And okay, like of course in this audience probably uh, everybody knows the uh, formal definition of the, uh, of the sister algebra. And it's quite interesting that in the say 100 years ago, uh, the study of sister algebra appeared from from quantum physics, right? But but then it was like get found in Neymar. They had this formal definition of a sister algebra, and uh, I I was talking uh, to people who were working with Gelfand, and they said that like uh, because Gelfand was also working a lot of in combinatorial geometry, right? And they were saying that he tried to explain them that actually those you, you can get sister algebras from from some kind of more combinatorial setting, but it was not like picked picked up. So I didn't find any papers, but uh, apparently there is a there is a lot of connections with this kind of more or less what what I talk about buildings, and there, there are like very very natural sister algebras which can be. Uh, associated to buildings, but um, so here, like this, this is like usually, usually like in the five minutes of your talk, you get to the results which you wanted to describe. So, um, also like in this picture language seminar, there were many uh, connections with like category theory, right? That um, sometimes in you think about like very, very general settings. And what can happen that uh, people working in like sister algebras, when uh, uh, like Pumjan and Pask and Aidan Thames, they were, um, and his group were defining so-called like K graphs, but they were defining them in a very, very categorical setting. So, uh, this is the original definition of about 20 years ago that it's a countable category uh, with the functor which goes to the degree, right? And to the power k is the degree, which we also like discussed yesterday briefly. And you need to have a unique factorization property of this uh, countable category such that, that if you have like D of A is M plus M, then there are unique elements A1 and A2 in this category, such that D of A1 is M and D of A2 is N. But you see those M and N, they are not just numbers, right? They are they are pieces of a, of a grid. So in a way, uh, this category sits on a grid and it makes it very, very difficult to work with k, k rank graphs in, the, in this kind of language of categories because uh, 
until like um, I started to work with this with, with my collaborators, uh, there were no like non-trivial examples starting with uh, uh, rank three and and higher. And actually, this property of the cubes is somehow this kind of difficulty to get cubes together. It goes, it's, it seems to be some kind of almost some kind of universal property because you have this the same problem in the uh, world of categories. You cannot like glue it all, all together if you don't really work, work on it. But what was nice that there is a very good uh, theory of relating the, this higher rank graphs to the sister algebra. So if you have this higher rank graph, then you can get the sister algebra, but then there the were no kind of method to work with the higher rank graphs. And that's why in this kind of recent paper with Nadia Larson, we came up with the definition of of the k-dimensional d graph. And from the first side, this definition can look more scary than the original definition of the uh, k graph in the uh, language of categories, because the yeah the uh, the definition in the categories is like really very very short definition, but this one is really long, right? But here in this definition, we don't have any category theory anymore. So we have only combinatorics, but this combinatorics is a bit involved. So what is what is this kind of um, uh, k-dimensional graph? We have uh, the same finite set of vertices, right? So it's a yeah, in a way, it's a graph, kind of direct graph. But then, it, I think, ah, there, there are the right of different colors. So there are vertices, finite set of vertices, but then there are edges of different colors, and it's a directed graph. And then, what is the property? If you have if you have a directed path from one vertex to another, right? So you can say like a b, then there is a unique okay, here I have x, x and y okay. Then there, there is a unique path of length two, which is like p dash. A dash, which goes again from the same vertex to the same vertex. And this K is, can be any number, but always for any two colors, for there is a bijection between the paths of length two, right? So between all the paths of length two, you can always find uh, another path of length two which corresponds to it and which uh, connects the same two vertices. But then there is this kind of condition, extra compatibility on paths of length two. But again, like how we can think about this property that you have to be, if your edges go around the um, edges of cubes, then you also, they, every, everything has to be compatible, right? So this is like, this, this compatibility condition is that uh, your edges on, the, on this main diagonal have to um, coincide. And now, what you, I just give the idea how you get those high dimensional graphs from cube complexes. Because again, 
even modern computer, if you want to construct such the graphs using computers, right? Even modern computers would do this for a very, very long time. So again, you have to have some idea how you do this. And uh, like with, with Nadia, we have like um, uh, plenty of models how we how we get those G graphs, but I can just give them pictures behind the proofs. What is the idea? How you get the vertices, edges, and colors. So now let's go back to our cubes, right? Because the title of my talk, right? It's like high dimensional degraphs from cube complexes. Now let's have a cube complex. It has many cubes and of course, like usually each, each side of the cube belongs to many cubes, but here it's just kind of three dimensional picture to get the idea how we get the vertices and edges of the cube. So now each cube will give us a vertex, right? So saying those three, three cubes which we have here, and we, we will draw a part of the graph. So I'm really lucky that the colors of the chalk here match, match the colors of my uh, sides of the cubes because so this vertex B, right? So we have this uh, cube B, cube A, and cube C. So this will be our vertex A. This will be our vertex B. This will be our vertex C. And then when we put an edge between the vertices, if our two cubes have a, uh, have a uh, face with the same labeling, so we, we put this pink edge, right? And the same, if put this blue edge here. But this is just a small, small fragment of a graph. The graph would be like, yeah, many, many cubes. And of course, all degrees of vertices are quite high. It's just kind of the idea how we get the D graph from a cube complex, right? So here, we could put edge here and edge here. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention just in the very end. I want to show some kind of related projects and further directions of research. And yeah, are there any questions? Well, thank you very much for an interesting talk. Is it possible to do analysis on these higher dimensional pictures? Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very good question that the question is like, what what kind of analysis, right? So so one of the uh, examples that uh, uh, I have um, actually quite old paper where um, it's, it was published in Dafa in 2011, it's called like super rigidity of hyperbolic buildings. Uh, so um, to do this kind of super rigidity results uh, with collaborators in one, we, we developed some kind of uh, harmonic maps of buildings. So the, the idea of harmonic maps of buildings goes back to uh, Gromov and Shane, who proved like uh, super rigidity of Euclidean buildings. But then this can be uh, generalized to the hyperbolic buildings and it can go like to high dimension as well. We didn't write it up, but I think it goes goes in a similar in a similar way. So it's like, but on the other hand, one has one can also think what would be interesting saying from your point of view, from the point of view of 
physics, right? What kind of analysis, right? Like, because, yeah, so this is what I, because I, I, I was right that it probably it wouldn't be enough of time to talk about this um, spectral properties of those complexes. So another another way, it's like we also in the same paper with Jack of Six, we showed that uh, our uh, complex, our cube complexes are so-called like Ramanujan, that if you define the, you can define the adjacent operators, on each color, but then those uh, mm, uh, there is a uh, notion of a simultaneous spectrum because then for each color, so for for each color, then uh, the, the 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 operators for each color commute, so you can find the gem, uh, the joint spectrum, and then you have the uh, in in our case you have the best possible bounds for the. For the spectral gaps of, of, of these uh, complexes, so they are kind of as nice as possible, and uh, you you can do like so the spectral yeah. gaps are for what operator? So this is like for for Laplace operator on the on the graphs, but I think that probably this kind of complexes you you may try other types of operators as well because it's like they would. Uh, there, there is this number theory which which helps to get like kind of additional analysis. Yeah, we can we can discuss this. Yeah. But but there is a standard notion of derivative. So I didn't think about what what is exactly, but it's like this is what what we would only discuss yesterday. But it looks like it would involve. I, I don't have anything written about this, but yeah, we, we can well, discuss. For your transformation. So for for Fourier transformation, I know that again there is a for for graphs it's quite well developed and uh, I haven't tried, but again I don't see a reason why this won't go because so but when you go to this high dimension, what can be like a difficult difficulty is that because you have several several operators which have to live there at the same time. But they are kind of nice operators which commute. So I think this property probably doesn't depend even so much on which operator you look at. It more depends on the geometric properties of the cube. But it's a speculation, right? Like you can check if it's if it's correct. Are there any online questions? Well, if there are no other questions, let's thank Alina again for a very interesting talk. Next week is Thanksgiving. We'll not have a seminar then, but we'll continue two weeks from today. Thank you very much. See you then. <laughs>